On this edition of Defense News Weekly, find out the latest country looking to buy the F-35, get the inside scoop on the new national defense strategy, and see the latest weapons from SHOT Show 2018. With in-depth interviews, up-close video, and leading analysis, this is Defense News Weekly. Welcome to this week's edition of Defense News Weekly. I'm Jeff Martin. The federal government has reopened after a three-day shutdown, but another is looming on the horizon. After the U.S. Senate was unable to come to a deal on January 19th, the government was shut down for about 67 hours. Lawmakers eventually came to a deal to fund the government temporarily, but roadblocks like immigration and defense spending still stand in the way of a comprehensive budget deal, almost four months after one was due. Belgium is the latest country to set its sights on the F-35. While the European nation hasn't yet announced the winner of their fighter competition, the State Department has cleared Belgium to purchase 34 of the conventional version of the Lockheed Martin-made aircraft, along with 38 Pratt & Whitney engines for the aircraft. The F-35 is competing against the Dassault Rafale and the Eurofighter Typhoon. It's unclear when a final decision might be made. Belgium currently operates Lockheed Martin F-16s. The Royal Singaporean Air Force takes delivery of its first of six KC-30 tankers from Airbus this year according to officials in Singapore. The tanker based on the Airbus A330 commercial airliner is also in service in Australia, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and the United Kingdom. Countries that have ordered the tanker include South Korea, Germany, France, and the Netherlands. For Singapore, the aircraft will replace American-made KC-135 tankers. We have ignition and liftoff of the United Launch Alliance. What you're watching is the latest launch of the Pentagon's space-based infrared surveillance system which is designed to monitor ballistic missile launches all over the world. The mission atop an Alabama-built Atlas V rocket was successful. The SPURS system replaces and supplements Cold War-era defense support program satellites. The Pentagon has released a new national defense strategy, its first in more than a decade. The strategy, unveiled in a speech at Johns Hopkins Washington campus, details how the U.S. needs to focus on nations like Russia and China as the top priority, rather than fighting terrorism. While much of the document is classified, the unclassified version offers a wealth of insight into Secretary Jim Mattis' goals for the Pentagon. The Secretary said in his speech that America has to continue to work to maintain dominance. The military is still strong, yet our competitive edge has eroded in every domain of warfare, air, land, sea, space, and cyberspace, and it is continuing to erode. And history makes clear that America has no preordained right to victory on the battlefield. Simply, we must be the best if the values that grew out of the Enlightenment are to survive. It is incumbent upon us to field a more lethal force if our nation is to retain the ability to defend ourselves and what we stand for. To get the inside scoop on what exactly this new strategy means, I sat down with Defense News Associate Editor Aaron Mehta. Here's a look at that interview. So Aaron, for those that don't know, what is this national defense strategy that we're hearing talked about all over the news right now? Yeah, so the national defense strategy is part of the series of kind of nested strategies that are coming out of the Trump administration. Uh, the first step was the national security strategy, which happened in December. That's kind of the overarching interagency. This is what we think the security picture looks like. This is how we'll try to address it. The national defense strategy, which was released on January 19th, is the Pentagon's portion of that. Essentially, this is a document crafted by Secretary Mattis and his team that says, in accordance with the uh, national security strategy, we're going to meet those uh, goals and those missions. This is how we're going to do it, and this is our portion that we're really focused on. How much do we actually see of this document that's public? I mean, a lot of it would seem to be more classified. Yeah, so this is about uh, a 10-page, give or take, document uh, mm -hmm. that we've seen, which is the, classified, the unclassified summary. There is a classified version. Uh, we were told it's about five times in length from the document that we've seen. Uh, general assumption among us is it's probably longer than that, frankly. You just figure tables and all sorts of stuff are in there. Mm -hmm. um, the other part of this is still to come is the national military strategy, which is going to be crafted by uh, the Joint Chiefs. And that's kind of a document that will come later this year that's essentially saying, this is how we're going to do what's in the national defense strategy, which is the focus of the national security strategy. So it's almost you have your ideas, your here's how we're going to do it, and here's the force we need to do that? Exactly. Okay, so with all of this, what you were at Secretary Mattis' speech when he unveiled it, what was your feeling about this, the actual strategy that was unveiled? Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, you're going to hear this is the first national defense strategy in 10 years. That is a true statement. But 
part of the reason is that uh, this national defense strategy is actually mandated by Congress. It's a replacement for what was called the quadrennial, quadrennial defense review every four years. Defense That's quite review. a mouthful. It <laughs> quite is. And Congress was never a big fan of that. They've gotten rid of that. The QDR, which 2010 they happened, 2014 they happened, those are kind of these big overarching documents that said everything was in there. Each service had a portion. Each part of OSD had a portion. It was this massive just kind of state of defense. Uh, this document is much more focused, and it's focused very much on what Mattis's priorities are. Mm -hmm. Now, since coming to office, he said consistently he has three priorities. Reform the business practices, increase lethality, which in a lot of ways means technology or capability for this uh, warfighter, and to uh, support and, and grow allied capabilities. You saw those three things very much in this document. Again, this is the Mattis document. A lot of people have said, well, growing allies, that seems to be at odds with some of the things the Trump administration has said. Mm -hmm. Mattis has consistently said this. This is the Pentagon's document. And that's something we refer to from DOD leaders across the board. Exactly. That growing allies is a priority and work that has to be done. With your kind of reaction, what else have you kind of heard about the strategy from other Defense Department officials? Yeah, you know, the big question that with any sort of strategy, right, because the Pentagon is basically a five-sided box, and if you look at the walls of that said box, uh, it's really made up of calcified reports from decades and decades that went nowhere. So the big question is, why should this be different? Why does this document matter? And when you talk to officials, they say, look, it's because Jim Mattis knows the building, he understands what needs to be done, and he is one driving this. Uh, I was traveling with uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Joe Dunford, right before the strategy came out. I asked him that specific question. Why should we believe this document will matter? Mm -hmm. And his answer was, Jim Mattis, by force of will, will make this thing happen. We'll see. We've heard that certainly from other people. Mattis is quite the personality. Whether he can, It's a bold statement. Mattis is a personality. Nobody's going to doubt that. Whether he can drive this thing through, we'll see. The big question is going to be where the money goes. And we'll see a little bit in the 19 budget, which is going to come up. And then they've said already from the Pentagon, the 2020 budget will be where you really see the influence of this thing. So with all of this, what's next? So we've gotten the national security strategy got the national defense strategy, we have the national military strategy. What's after that? What, are we ever going to see an end to reports being dumped on us, it feels like? No, it's the Pentagon. There's always going to be reports dumped <laughs> on enough, us. Fair enough, fair enough. So, right, upcoming, uh, I would expect late summer is when we'll see the national military strategy based on what Dumford told me. Uh, we have coming up in early February the nuclear posture review, which has actually leaked already, so we've seen pretty much what's in there, but we'll see the final version uh, in early February. And then either late February or early March, we'll see the ballistic missile review, which is going to take a look at that area as well. So reviews always coming, and the question is always is, what would their lasting impact be? We'll see when the budget comes. All right, Aaron, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. To keep up to date with all of our coverage, be sure to visit our Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn pages. Also, be sure to add us on Apple News and other platforms for the latest updates. And when we come back, find out who's being honored in Washington, hear from the military's top enlisted leader, and go inside a cyber attack. Today's program is provided in part by Raytheon, proud partner of FifthDomain.com, the sister site of Defense News, dedicated to all things cyber. Learn more at FifthDomain.com. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. It's been more than 100 years since America entered World War I, and yet there's no true memorial to it in Washington, D.C. So one organization is working to put that memorial in Washington, D.C.'s Pershing Square. As part of that effort, the World War I Centennial Commission presented the first of the 2018 World War I Centennial Silver Dollars to Military Times at our headquarters outside Washington, D.C. On hand was the grandson of the famous and highly decorated soldier Sergeant Alvin York. Retired Colonel Gerald York says the coin raises awareness for all those who died in the Great War. The last veteran died several years ago of World War I, so there are no living veterans. So this commission was formed to tell the story of World War I because they're no longer around to tell the story. Uh, the importance for me, being a veteran myself, and my grandfather, of course, was in World War I, but uh, for me, the significance is that America doesn't forget their veterans, that even though there are no living veterans around to speak for themselves, the commission is there to speak for those veterans that have passed on. Red carpet award ceremonies are typically reserved for movie stars, but in Washington recently, the awardees were not household names. Still, their contributions to society deserve recognition. People that take the time and the energy to, to give back and be unselfish, um, there's probably no greater gift that you can give to another human being than, you know, than that. It might have only been the third Veterans Awards show or Vetties, but it certainly didn't feel like it, as celebrities, veterans, honorees, and guests 
filled the ballroom at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C. Such a humbling experience. I mean, we're, we're giving a spotlight to these people who we only pretend to play on the screen. So they're real heroes, and, and it's, it's, it's just amazing to be here. As host Jake Tapper said, it was an honor just to be there to shine a light on veterans' issues. The mainstream media that is not focused on defense of veterans doesn't do enough of it. Um, I don't do enough of it, but it's an incredibly important part. We've been at war now. And for those being honored, like Sarah Verardo, knowing that they were there for veterans when they were needed was deeply moving. T to me, seeing so many incredible people come together show that America cares about its military, which is vital right now, always, but especially right now. Throughout the military, commanders have senior enlisted advisors who represent the interests of troops under their command. Not only is Command Sergeant Major John Troxell the highest ranking enlisted member of the military, he also serves as the senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Command Sergeant Major Troxell stopped by Military Times for a reporter roundtable. Here are some of the highlights of his thoughts on getting the right people into the military. You know, we've got to be diligent in our recruiting uh, stations and in our recruiting uh, commands out there in terms of prospecting for talent more so than processing. At the height of the surge in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, whether it be a sense of patriotism by young Americans or whatever it was, they were, you know, coming through the doors of our recruiting stations and it was easy to get the talent we need. Not so much anymore. Our recruiters have to be getting out and they have to meet the influencers now that are influencing young men and women. And that could be educators at school, it could be coaches, it could be members of uh, the community like the Chamber of Commerce, but we've got to be out and getting after what we call those spheres of influence or those centers of influence uh, that uh, young men and women look to. And we've got to partner with them to get after the talent we need. And when you look at the direction we need to go to maintain competitive advantages over any potential threats, especially in cyberspace and nuclear domain and space domain, we need some very, very talented young men and women. We are a respected institution, the United States Armed Forces, because we take young men and women and we train them, we educate them, and we, we allow them to reach their untapped potential. And without rigor, without the discipline we need, and without the standards, we wouldn't be the respected organization we are. We have to prepare men and women uh, because combat is so brutal and unforgiving, and just because you're not an infantry soldier or you're not out at sea or you're not a pilot, um, at any given time, uh, you could be facing the worst day of your life. And so for every man and woman that joins the military, regardless of what their specialty is, we have to prepare them physically, mentally, emotionally, technically, and tactically to fight and win and to uh, be victorious on the worst day of their life. Uh, over the past 16 years, we've seen several non-combat specialties end up in close combat uh, when they weren't anticipating being in close combat. So we have to have this standard of building a warrior first, and then we go after the other talents we need. Now, because cyber skills and, and skills like that are tough to get at, that just means we have to you know, use a little bit more um, ingenuity at getting after this talent. Reforming the Veterans Administration has been a top priority for Secretary David Shulkin. As he explains to Military Times' as Leo Shane, it's a difficult task, but one he takes seriously. You've spent a lot of time talking uh, to both committees up there, trying to convince them uh, to reform community care and talk about the new, the new care program. Uh, grade that so far. I mean, we still don't have a, a full bill. You're still working off another bridge fund for choice. Do you feel like this is are, are you frustrated at this point? Are you upset that we're not past this already? Well, I think it's uh, consistent with my earlier comments, which is that I'm generally impatient. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm not happy with our grade because we've not 
accomplished our mission. What we've done is we've continued the status quo of the choice program. And um, when you're in an organization where I've come out and I've said, I think we need to move quicker and we need to transform the organization and you end up with the status quo, I don't think you can be happy with that. Um, I think that what Congress has done is responsible, which is to continue the funding for the current choice program because the alternative of letting that program run out of money and essentially go away would be the worst outcome. So fortunately, we're able to continue the program with the continuing resolution adding another period of funding of approximately five or six months. But yes, I'm dissatisfied. I want this program to be better, to work better, to implement what we've learned uh, will work better and what hasn't worked in the past. It's still too complex, bureaucratic, and administratively run. So it's not serving veterans in the way that I believe it should. And I know that we can do better. And so we are working very closely with both the Senate and the House. And as you know, both uh, the Senate and the House who have terrific leadership on both the Republican and the Democratic side, I'm extremely proud of our leaders in these committees, have both passed bills out of their committees. Now they need to bring them to the floors and move on with the process. And that's something which I want them to do as soon as possible. Does it, does it concern you at all that, that really a year into these conversations, you're still getting the privatization pushback? You're still hearing from critics and, and from you know even some of your Democratic allies on the Hill that too much of this idea of outside care amounts to dismantling VA. I know, I know this has been something that you've been sensitive to. So, I mean, are you, are you at, at what point does the impatience turn into, uh, you know, near rage for, for this still coming up? Uh, I think this is a very appropriate debate. So I'm not at all frustrated. I think these are legitimate points of view. I think that if you don't handle this well, you could end up by creating a choice program that's not well thought out, you could end up dismantling the VA and essentially privatizing it. And as I've said many times, that would be a huge mistake, in my opinion, for veterans and for the American public. Um, I believe a strong VA is essential to national security, particularly when you have a voluntary force like we have. And everything that I'm doing is trying to strengthen the VA system. I think the way that you do strengthen the VA system and you fulfill your mission is by working closely with the private sector. So this is a very, very difficult balance. Much of what happens in Washington is a balance between uh, two political ideologies so that you can get it right for the American public. And so I think continually having this debate about whether you are the work that you're doing is strengthening the VA or whether it's hurting the VA is an appropriate dialogue. And I don't get frustrated by that at all because I think it helps define the path forward. And I believe that what we're doing is we are finding that path forward where we are both strengthening the VA while at the same time using the private sector to fulfill our mission and make sure that veterans are getting the care they need. Okay, but you. I, so this is a debate. I, I mean, did you expect this much debate? You're not, you know, you you were undersecretary for health. You're not new to any of this. You know the, the glacial pace that Congress can move at. But I don't know if you expect it, given the pressures on the choice program and the funding issues, to still be having this, this conversation in 2018. Well, uh, first of all, um, I don't think that this is. Um, disappointed me in terms of expectations. I think that when you think about a system like this, uh, I actually feel fortunate that we have so many knowledgeable people on Capitol Hill and in the White House on this, and I feel fortunate that there are so many people who are passionate about getting this right. Uh, I never had expectation that things were going to move quickly, uh, as, but as long as they're moving in the right direction, and I do believe they are moving in the right direction. Uh, you know, I wish that things would move faster, but I also know that in order to get this right, there has to be a certain amount of dialogue, public disclosure, um, getting this written in the right way, and that process does take time. And, and uh, 
So I think that we're I think that we're on track with where we need to be. Don't go away. When we come back, see the latest weapons from Shot Show 2018 in Las Vegas and go inside a cyber attack. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. On this week's Money Minute, personal finance expert Jeanette Mack offers her tips on getting a home equity loan. Ask yourself how long you've been in your current home. If you're like most Americans, according to the National Association of Home Builders, the average is 13 years. That's a good long time. Time enough for your home to want to show some appreciation, meaning you may be looking for ways to tap into the equity in your home. Home improvements are the number one reason people go for equity loans, and it's a valuable one. Not only do you get the pleasure of living in a renovated house, but you can also reap the rewards of increased value when you sell. Other ways to use equity include paying for college tuition or advanced degrees, paying off or consolidating debt. Wise moves since equity loans most of the time have lower rates, possibly lowering your monthly payments. As long as the value in your home is steady, you'll regain equity as your home's value increases over the years and you pay off the principal on your loan. A home equity loan can be a smart way to reach your financial goals. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next week. To get more Defense News coverage, be sure to visit our website at defensenews.com and subscribe to our early bird brief, delivered to your inbox every weekday morning to get you ready to start the day. And when we come back, we'll give you an inside look at a cyber attack and show you the latest weapons from SHOT Show 2018 in Las Vegas. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. The need to protect cyber networks has intensified. But for those in the defense industry whose job it is to train the protectors, that task can be just as daunting. Executive Editor Jill I. Toro talked to Raytheon recently to see how cyber professionals there are using virtual reality to prepare. Every day in the newspaper or any kind of media or the things that are going around in our personal life, the, the density, the complexity of cyber attacks, you know, keep getting, you know, worse and worse. So the cyber force really has to have, you know, a way to look at uh, how they prepare for a variety of threats and, and be agile for those threats in, in, a, in a pretty dynamic way. That's Bill Lair, the Director of Government Cyber Solutions for Raytheon. Recently, the company took Fifth Domain through their virtual reality trainer for cyber defense, showing just what a cyber attack looks like to a computer. I'm clicking this button, and here I am. And as an instructor, I can come up and I can identify, and if you come a little closer, you can actually identify you know, this code is the bad code. The trainer allows students to visualize the individual factors that comprise a cyber attack, figure out how to properly respond, and train on the skills needed to prevent such an attack next time. Because of that, they see cyber training systems, like the one you see here, becoming standard within the Pentagon, but they won't be bought like traditional software. That's going to be a traditional, uh, I, I think, defense uh, industry relationship and, and not the same as we think about it in the commercial space where I may be you know selling a service and I'm gonna go run man your sock for you or something like this I think these will be uh, a capability that DOD will procure and you know sailor soldiers airmen marine will get trained to use it to read more about all things cyber be sure to visit fifthdomain.com and for fifth domain I'm Jill I. Toro typically a rifle or a pistol might have a dozen configurations but at SHOT Show 2018 Retired Navy SEAL Clint Emerson got his hands on the Sig Sauer MCX, which has hundreds, and gives us his take. We had the pros from SIG tell us all about the MCX. It's a platform that's been around for a couple of years, has 500 configurations. Let's hear it from them, and then we'll come back to me. So the MCX is an incredibly versatile platform. It's a full modular battle rifle. Um, this rifle comes in multiple configurations. What you're looking at here is the DMR configuration, patrol. Uh, it has the M-lock rigid handguard, two-position adjustable gas valve, uh, rigid barrel that has improved accuracy from the prior generation. Uh, you still have your key feature of the MCX, which is your foldability as well as a telescoping ability so you can break it down into a smaller more compact variation to transport it and still have the adjustability to adjust the stock length you have our new match light duo trigger which is a super uh, lightweight uh, two-stage match trigger and the the mcx is configurable between a uh, 9 inch, 11 inch, 16 inch, and 6 and 3 quarter between 300 blackout and 556. So you have multiple different caliber configurations as well as also having the versatility of being able to go back and forth between different lengths. So as noted, this thing has 500 configurations. Some of those configurations actually take place 
at manufacturing level. And then once it gets to your military unit, you can do probably another, let's say, 200 configurations specific to the operator. That's changing out the barrels, allowing you to chamber three different kinds of ammunition. You can run 556, 762, or 300 blackout, depending on the configuration. You can do long barrel, short barrel. You can do different stocks. It is a great weapon. I had a lot of time shooting it, and that's my two cents. That's all we have time for this week. But if you want to see and read more, be sure to head over to defensenews.com. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week.